Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is Jacob Solom, senior editor at Reason Magazine and author of For Your Own Good, The Anti-Smoking Crusade and the Tyranny of Public Health, and Saying Yes in Defense of Drug Use. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Jacob. Thanks. Why did you write a book defending drug use? Were you just trying to check all the libertarian cliches <laughs> or just – Well, my feeling at the time was that a lot of people were criticizing the war on drugs. A lot of people were calling – for at least a relaxation of it, the escalation of it, um, if not for outright legalization. But they tended to sort of uh, apologize or preface, preface the conversation by saying, of course, I don't approve of drug use. Nobody should use – kids don't don't do drugs. <laughs> Stay away from drugs. Nobody's saying that drug use is good or that it should be approved of. And, and, and there's a valid distinction there because obviously you can make something legal without saying it's morally uh, praiseworthy or, or, or OK. Um, you know, you, for example, you can disapprove of prostitution and still think it should be legal, right? So, th- so that's valid to say that. But I felt like people who condemn – sort of reflexively condemn them drug use hadn't really given much thought to the moral basis for that attitude. And it seemed to me that the drug use is, you know, is, is not inherently bad or good, right? It's a thing that people do and it can bring them pleasure and can improve their lives or can bring them pain and, you know, destroy their lives, right? It, it all depends on how they use drugs, the relationship with, with the substance. Um, so I sort of wanted to write a book making that point because I felt like that wasn't being emphasized enough in the debate over drug policy reform. Um, and that if we could talk about illegal drugs the way that people routinely talk about alcohol, uh, that that would be helpful, that we can make the same kinds of moral distinctions and legal distinctions, right? So uh, with alcohol, we understand they're social drinkers and they're fine and they, they drink and they enjoy it and it doesn't cause any serious problems for them. And then there are people who uh, drink all the time and for years and it – you know, it kills them. Um, there are people who drink all the time for years, and it doesn't actually end up killing them. Yes. And, they, and, and they're functional. I, hate, yeah. I don't like the word functional. Well, much, yeah, I, you, you, there may be somebody who is drinking, slowly drinking himself to death, but otherwise is not. He's hurting himself, but he's not hurting anyone else. That's possible too, right? He's not going out and driving drunk and killing people or, or beating up anybody or whatever. And he's showing up to work on time. Yes, he's showing it. up to work and he's being responsible. And so I, I don't want to say that's not a problem. It's a problem for him and yeah. probably the people close to him. But it is not a problem that calls for government intervention. And so we recognize that when it comes to alcohol, that just because somebody is a heavy drinker and it's causing problems for him and his family doesn't mean we should arrest him, right? And so people sort of intuitively understand that. And I thought there really is no rational justification for not applying those distinctions to other substances just because they happen at this point in time to be – Illegal. I mean, it, you know, for a while, you know, marijuana was legal and alcohol wasn't. So mm-hmm. there's nothing, yeah. it's nothing set in stone about that. There's nothing inevitable about that. That is purely contingent based on culture and politics and, and you know, how governments decide what, what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed. So that, that's, that's a long way of, of explaining it, but that's sort of it, not in a nutshell, in, in, in a bag of nuts. But that means you had to, yeah. you had to bite the bullet about – I mean, I, I'm a D.A.R.E. kid. I grew up in D.A.R.E., so so I clearly know a lot about drugs uh, from right, my D.A.R.E. Right. officer. And I learned that heroin, if you do it once, you're basically addicted. I mean, so marijuana is easy. Alcohol, you know, we understand that. But how could you defend heroin use? Well, I, I think uh, heroin use can – heroin can be used in a uh, a moderate controlled way. And – to begin with, if you look at people who try heroin, the vast majority of them do not ever become addicted. Secondly, of those who do you know, become regular users, uh, the typical pattern is to stop doing that at some point. As Generally, as people mature, and this is not just for, for heroin, but for other kinds of drugs too. You know, people who are heavy drinkers in, in college or in young adulthood – very often will start behaving themselves better when they have other get things married, to do. They have children. They, yes, they have important jobs and so on, uh, because they have other things that give their life meaning, and uh, and they don't feel a need to use that substance excessively anymore. Um, so yes, I mean, I interviewed some you know some people for the book who who uh, used heroin in a controlled way. They were responsible people. It was not ruining them medically. Uh, it was not ruining them uh, professionally. Um, I cited one example. This was actually on the front page of the New York Times, which was amazing. I think it was back in the 90s uh, about a successful businessman who used heroin regularly um, 
And the only reason he was thinking of stopping is that it bothered his wife and it bothered maybe a couple of other people close to him. It wasn't like it led him to do ruinous things that were really hurting other people or that it wasn't affecting his work or anything like that. He was uh, doing this in a, you know, a controlled, responsible way for, for one. <laughs> Probably the biggest fear he had. Yeah. Um, that was not, so it wasn't interfering with his life. Well, in law a, enforcement in a would be way. the biggest fear. That yes, unless have. he gets yeah. arrested. Um, but that was actually amazing to me that they would even run that on the front page of the New York Times because that was so contrary to conventional wisdom on the left and the right about what drugs do. Um, we have this notion that you know drugs take possession of you and force you to first of all keep taking them, right? <laughs> that's first step, and also to do all kinds of other horrible things. And that's I sort of go into those themes in that in that book. Um, but we, at the same time that we say that and we hear that from the government, we clearly know it's not true, right? Because we're told uh, that legally produced opioids, the kind that you're prescribed for pain, that these are very very similar to to heroin in terms of their effects, and that's true. And this is just like heroin, people will say. And But what do we know about those pills and what happens when people take them? Uh, only a very small uh, minority of people who take uh, legally produced opioids, whether for medical use or for non-medical use. That's not the narrative I've heard. Have uh, No, that, that, that it's only a small minority who actually- right. well, I've heard that we got this become problem. Become heavy users. Yeah. Yes. Well, but we're, what's the source of the problem? Who are the people who are, are using heavily? It is, uh, if you look at the data from the government surveys, you had close to a lot of people used opioids. I mean, in a given year, it's close to uh, 100 million people. With prescriptions for like, because they got their wisdom teeth out or something like well, that. Is, so this medical users and non medical. Okay. So it's not just people who had prescribed for them, but also people who swiped somebody else's, you know, the remains of their prescription. Which, by the way, that in itself, the fact that you routinely have all these bottles of unused prescriptions left, which which is presented as a problem because now the kids can get it or it can be stolen and sold on the black market. But why were they unused? Right. <laughs> so yeah. if these were dr drugs were as compelling as, as the government says they are, nobody would ever have an unused prescription. Everybody would use it all and then want more. Right. Right? But that's clearly not the typical pattern. The, the experience of using just part of a prescription is very common, and you, your pain is gone, and you stop using it. And uh, that's the typical experience. So the survey data suggests that something like 2% of people in a given year who are using opioids, this is, this is the you know uh, legally produced ones, uh, develop some sort of problem. So not necessarily for blown addiction, but some sort of drug-related problem that is having a negative impact on their life in one way or another. Um, and the rate for alcohol, like who, this is, all right, so I guess to use the technical terminology that they use, they say opioid use disorder, yes. right? And that covers, I, I, it covers a wide spectrum. So it's not just addiction. It's problematic other, other use. less serious, problematic, some reduced that's problematic in some way. Um, but compare that to uh, the percentage of drinkers in a given year who ha ha qualify for a uh, diagnosis of alcohol, alcohol use disorder, uh, which is, I think, eight or 9%. So it's, it's, Several times as high, the rate. Is alcohol inevitably addicting? Is it? I mean, it looks on the face of it like it's more addictive than yeah. than opioids, it's and serious. by extension, than heroin, because we've, we're told these are the same thing. Um, so people have a cockeyed notions, I guess, based on what is legal and what's not legal. They assume that if something is illegal, it must be more dangerous and that it must, among other things, be more addictive, have a more powerful hold on people because that's why it had to be banned, right? And this is not true. There is no rhyme or reason to the distinctions that you know, the drug laws draw. Um, and that's hard to persuade people of. Um, and it's interesting, now that we're living in a time where, where marijuana is moving out of the illicit category, it's becoming a legal drug, we're going to have to deal with that, not just you know legally, but as a society, what are the norms and the expectations that surround marijuana use? Now, obviously, even when it was illegal, People knew the difference between, you know, a pothead who never accomplished anything and somebody who was just an occasional cannabis consumer who was a high achiever, right? Yeah. But, uh, now that it's open and legal, uh, we can talk about that, uh, more candidly, I think, and more openly and, and, uh, talk to your kids about what is responsible marijuana use and what's irresponsible marijuana use, right? Just like you, you distinguish, distinguish, uh, between, uh, uh, responsible drinking and, and, and reckless drinking or excessive drinking. Well, that's interesting. You said talk to your kids and we recently had, um, a book published by the author's name is case his New York Times author called Tell Your Children. Oh, Alex Berenson. Al yes, yeah. Alex Berenson. Um, 
which ironically is the original title of Reefer Madness. Yes, yes. I think it was on purpose. I, yes, I thought he was yeah, not paradox. He was, yes, yeah, yeah, unintentionally. He was, I think it was a joke. Uh, yeah. like, he knew this was going to really bother people uh, like, people like uh, you, <laughs> legalizers and reformers, and it was like an in-your-face sort of thing. But, I mean, does he have a point? But well, I mean, you I, just I, said talk to your children about the harmful effects of marijuana. Is that kind of like Well, I'm telling you, talk to your children about what is, what is it that make, can, make, can make drug use harmful. Yes. Right. What, what are irresponsible and responsible ways of using not just marijuana, but, but all kinds of psychoactive substances? That's what the, the distinction I'm drawing. Um, He's a prohibitionist, though. That... Um, Yes, and and even though the title is sort of a joke, a dig, I guess, at his opponents, it's basically the message of the book is basically the message of reefer madness. And he, he says in so many words that Harry Anslinger, who was the, used to be the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and campaigned for, first of all, marijuana prohibition at the state level, uh, encouraged states to pass bans, and then ultimately got Congress to pass a ban in the guise of a, of a tax bill. Um, that uh, Berenson says he was right. No, he says he was a racist, which is true. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, but Berenson's argument about marijuana is that it does make people, it makes people kill people. It makes people violent. Uh, not everybody, but a, a, a large enough percentage of the population that this is going to be a serious problem. And he is predicting that, uh, as marijuana is legalized in more and more states, you're going to see big increases in violent crime, aggravated assaults, homicides. Uh, I don't think we will. Um, we know it's that. Not my that, experience that, with marijuana. That, um, no, I mean, <laughs> I'm from Colorado. I've been around it a lot. So. Yes, <laughs> and, and you know, you can look at the states that have already legalized, and there is not much evidence if you compare them to uh, control states, and you try to figure out well, what would have happened if Colorado. What would you have expected to happen if Colorado hadn't legalized? And how is the current trend different? That's what you have to do. And the studies that do that don't find that there is this uh, notable impact on violent crime. But here's the question. What if there is? I mean, we would notice it eventually if there but, is. But I mean, what should we say about that in terms of a public health issue? Because alcohol, I mean, I've, deba right. I've debated Kevin Sabet a couple of times yeah. from Smart Approaches to Marijuana and – I'm pretty sure that Kevin thinks that alcohol should be illegal or highly regulated. And some in the public health sphere uh, who might might seem like they're on our side when they're talking about lowering regulation of marijuana at the same time talk about raising all the taxes on right. alcohol because of the social harm of alcohol. It's unquestionably true that alcohol has created more violence in society, I think. I, I, I guess let me, let me – um... I don't quite agree with that. I think the amount of crime I committed think what on the alcohol. evidence shows is there is a much stronger association between drinking and violence than there is between marijuana and violence. In fact, the research does not suggest that there is a, a relationship between marijuana use and violent crime that is a causal relationship, which is what he's positing. Um, but even so, you are mainly talking about a correlation. And this is a very complicated uh, uh, situation where – if people think that that when you drink, you become violent, they're more likely to become violent when they drink. And they may use drinking as an excuse. And the classic example is the guy who beats his wife, but only after he gets drunk because now he has an excuse. Now, it may not get him off with the police, <laughs> but his wife may be less likely to report and begin with if he says, oh, I, I didn't know what I was doing and I'm so sorry. It was the, it was the booze. Right. Yeah. So you can see how uh, that that belief can actually be, it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy, and we know that in fact across different cultures you get radically different responses to alcohol. People behave dramatically different after consuming the same doses, depending upon the culture and the context within that culture. And an obvious example would be to compare how do frat how do frat boys behave when they're drinking beer at a party versus how do how uh, when they if they're I don't know if this is even possible anymore it used to be possible to go to a reception yeah <laughs> you know so in fact I went to one but it's sponsored by the president by of the, the college team, right the and you get yes. dressed up yeah. and they have wine there and you may drink exactly the same amount of alcohol in. Uh, but in the in the form of wine, as wine is supposed to be, you're going to behave better, and you're not you're probably not going to get into a drunken brawl. Um, and so that's an example from our society. But there are, are studies that look at different cultures and find dramatically different 
rates of so-called, you know, of, of alcohol-related violence, alcohol-associated violence, right? Um, and a lot of it has to do with, with what people are taught to expect and, and therefore what they think is, is uh, appropriate. Really, if you have a culture, I mean, this came out, you remember during the Kavanaugh hearings, a lot of people were saying he was a problem drinker and he drank so much and this is a character flaw. Even if he didn't sexually assault anyone, this is a problem. Yeah. Um, and I remember some of his defenders were like, well, who hasn't? Who hasn't gotten drunk and gotten into the bar? No, you know, you're not a real man. <laughs> Remember this? They <laughs> yeah, were like I literally do, yeah, saying yeah. Uh, And I, so I wrote this uh, blog post for reasons saying, um, I think that's not a good uh, belief to encourage. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, in my own experience, my own social circle, which is not representative of American general necessarily, but it's my experience, it's not true. Yeah. In other words, my friends don't get into, routinely get into bar brawls, and I've never gotten into one. And I've gone, to, I've been to a lot of bars and done a lot of drinking um, over the years, and I. I mean, I've observed probably uh, altercations that could have escalated into bar fights, but among strangers at bars, never seen an actual bar fight. But certainly nobody, you know, in my own social circle or family acts that way. Um, and uh, other people, though, I have lots of friends who's, who have come from different backgrounds and have much different experience, more like Brett Kavanaugh. So yeah. they're, they're, of course, you're going to get, you know, you go drinking and you get you, and you start hurling uh, uh, beer glasses and one thing leads to another and uh, – uh, everybody's bloodied. Yeah. And then you all laugh about it afterward. So yeah. that's totally, I guess, from my own experience, that's totally alien, alien to me. And so I don't see that as an effect of drinking. So that's a long way of saying that, that this purported causal relationship between drinking and violence is a lot more compl complicated than it sees, than it seems on the surface. And, and even more so, so with marijuana, what Alex Berenson is suggesting is that even though the most common experience, not just with me and my friends, but, but also, uh, uh, people in general is that people don't get violent when they smoke pot. They get, in fact, and in fact, people like Anslinger had to give up that idea eventually. And the opposite thing became the rap against motivation. Marijuana. It makes you yeah. indolent and you don't want to do anything. And you're very easy to arrest because you don't put up any resistance. I mean, um, and so it ruins your life in that way, right? Not because it makes you violent. Um, so certainly the common experience is not that it makes you violent. If anything, it mellows you out um, and you get along better than you otherwise would. Laboratory, you know, studies suggest the same thing. But what Berenson is saying is that while that may be true in general, there are certain people, uh, not necessarily with a, a, a psychiatric history, although he would say that's especially, especially problematic, but there are people who don't realize that they have this predisp predisposition to violence upon using marijuana. And that's what you have to watch out for. And you're going to have people who, who uh, use marijuana, freak out and kill somebody. I, don't, I know that sounds flippant, but that is what he's saying. I don't, I don't, that is a fair representation of his view is that, that some people are going to do that and we don't know who they are um, and that that's a problem. That so we're it's a precautionary see. principle. Yeah. So, so we don't know what's going to happen if we have massive right. legalization so, of marijuana. Yes. I don't – to me, this is not – this is a, a – you know, if it were true, it would be something to be concerned about for sure. But it's not an argument for making this illegal or keeping it illegal. Uh, you know, they're – People who react badly to all sorts of things that are legal, well, alcohol we just mentioned, right? Uh, so uh, it's uh, if it were true, it would be worth pointing out, uh, but it, it's not uh, a a solid moral argument for prohibition. Well, that's the sort of the question I was asking is that in the framework, what what's the framework that we should be working with? Because you know, despite talking about how much violence alcohol does cause, we there are drugs out there that have social costs to them, and the prohibitionists or the high restrictionists come in and say, "Look at all the accidents, look at all the death from cirrhosis of liver, look at spousal abuse or things like this," and then they're trying to say some of the same things about marijuana. Um, and in that face, you say, "I mean, should we be just admitting it to some degree?" And saying yes, this does cause problems because because and because what's the other side of the of the scale, right? I mean, it's like what, what, if, if here's the harm, what's the benefit? Right. Uh, well, to, first to any drug for the for, the, for yeah. the harm. First of all, uh, every drug has hazards. Yes, no such thing as a completely safe drug. Some are more hazardous in some respects than others. You know, alcohol is more hazardous in several important respects than marijuana, for example. Um, but, uh, you know, you always have to be concerned about, about hazards. But the fact that some people ignore those hazards or use drugs excess, uh, excessively does not mean that no one should be allowed to use those drugs. It does not follow because people 
abuse all kinds of things. Anything that, that they get pleasure out of, somebody's going to abuse that. <laughs> it's guaranteed. Yeah, yeah. And we, you know, we can go into a litany of things that people get into uh, bad relationships with, like shopping and eating and sex and ac- exercise even, right? Um, uh, playing video games. Gambling. Did we mention gambling? Um, right. So all of these, there, there are certain behaviors that people that, that either provide uh, pleasure or relieve stress that can become a preoccupation for people to such an extent that it really seriously disrupts their lives. And that's what we mean, or at least what I mean when we talk about addiction, right? Um, the fact that some people do that is not an argument for stopping everybody from doing it because that would be an argument for banning almost everything that you know can be misused or abused, um, and so we don't we don't ordinarily uh, consider that to be a legitimate uh, reason for for making public policy. Um, but if we, I mean, if we're yeah. talking about um, the upside, you know, legalizing, yeah. Uh, I mean, is is the benefit of you know getting high on heroin something we should be? You know, saying is a valid, worthwhile experience. Just this sort of empty pleasure you get from being high on heroin or, well, or whatever. Who's to say it's empty? Um, I think it's implicit in, the, in uh, the in the idea that you're sticking it in your arm to get well. Happy. I think well, I think uh, you would probably be more likely to be uh, uh, snorting it. Okay, or that. Um, yeah. And honestly, if there were, if these drugs were actually legal, I think most, first of all, most people aren't going to want to take heroin, period. We know that from based on how people react to it. Most people are not, don't find this attractive. Most people don't become addicted to it. Um, but you would have a, a, a range of opiate, opium derived products, some of which might be more appealing. So you could have opium tea. You could have opium that people smoke. It's very old fashioned, it's fragrant, you know, and some people could be into that. But I suspect the sort of people who might be into, into that, maybe with an old fashioned wooden pipe and all of the deal, you know, you know, it, it could be trendy. You could imagine that uh, the sort of people who might be interested in psychedelics, which is, uh, m- you know, much smaller than the percentage of, of Americans who, who are interested in using cannabis or in drinking. Um, so I, I think that the, the products that are legitimately more dangerous will, for that reason, have have relatively limited appeal. Um, but I think pleasure is important. And I know, you know, uh, it's good to have pleasure, uh, you know, as long as it doesn't ruin your life. Right. And I, what I'm saying is that typically it doesn't. And and if you talk about, for example, legalizing uh, marijuana, people will often say, well, I'm afraid if we legalize marijuana that, you know, cannabis consumption is going to go up and it almost certainly will. But I don't count that as a cost of legalization. That's a benefit. That means more people are getting pleasure from this source than this is pleasure they wouldn't otherwise have gotten because either because they were deterred by prohibition or the prices were too high. They were worried about getting arrested, whatever. They didn't trust black market products and we've seen <laughs> there are good reasons for not trusting black market products. Um, so what, for whatever reason, some people who weren't, who maybe used to smoke pot in college uh, but haven't done it in years, they might start again when it's legal. People who already are using may use more frequently. And what I would say, as long as that doesn't lead to any like measurable serious problem, that is a good thing. Um, people are, 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 consumers are getting more value. Um, there's this implicit Puritanicalism in this idea that, of what what I voiced in the last question. That yes, that it's this worthless. type of right. happiness versus this but, type. You no, know, I don't know. So, so let's talk about drinking. It's not worthless. I mean, people really like drinking. And there are lots of reasons why dry why they like suck it. for a reason. You know, it's yeah. fu- it's it's fun to have a few drinks and yeah. talk to your friends. It's fun, uh, you know, to go to a bar and meet people. Uh, uh, people, uh, if you're into uh, craft cocktails, there's. Uh, a never ending, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, range of, of drinks to try and experiment with. And that's fun and it's pleasurable in the same way that cooking is fun or a- any other kind of hobby like that where you're exploring fragrances, you know, smells and tastes and all that. Um, same thing goes with for, for marijuana, by the way. I mean, there is, I mean, I was sort of astonished. I'm not like some marijuana expert. It's like I write about it, but I, uh, I'm not a, like a huge aficionado, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but I, when I went to the first legal dispensaries in Colorado, I was actually I was amazed because first of all you have a much wider selection than you do in the black market, and the things actually smell like their names, right? And I thought that was always always thought that was because I bullshit. Oh, oh no, that was yeah, bullshit. Yeah, yeah. And um, and it's not because they have all these terpenes in there, and they generate these aromas that are similar to fruit aromas and similar to herb aromas, and it's the same thing as you would have with beer or wine or chocolate or any, you know whiskey or things like that that have all of these. 
complex flavors and smells. It's true of marijuana there's too. Even, there's even pairings so, with food. So in addition, yes, and you can yeah pair the right strain with your food, and then and then also claims about the kinds of effects you'll get based on the CBD and THC levels and all that. So there's a whole world, you know, for people who are kind of serious, a whole w- world to explore. In addition, and that's in addition to just you know getting high, and just getting high is never just getting high. You're getting high for a reason, and so you get high to relax with your friends, and you have a, a better a better time than you otherwise would have. Right? You have more fun. You watch a funny movie and it's funnier. You listen to a comedy album, it's funnier. You go to a concert, you enjoy it more. And that's real, right? I mean, this isn't fake pleasure. It's real pleasure. Um, Ask Grateful Dead fans. Yes. (laughs) So I don't think there's anything shameful about it. There's nothing to apologize for. Uh, You're not hurting yourself. You're not hurting anyone else. You're having a good time. Uh, we need more pleasure. I mean, wh- one of the few things that Kamala Harris said when she was running for the Democratic nomination, uh, one of the few things she said that I actually like wanted to applaud or at least give you know one cheer to was, I think she said, we need more joy in life, talking specifically about marijuana. I, and, and, of course, she mis- misrepresented her history about <laughs> – she, she, was, she was in favor of marijuana prohibition until basically yesterday, but – but what she said was good. It was a, you know, you, you you agree that we should legalize marijuana, and she said something to the effect of, uh, yes, we should because we need more joy in life. And I thought that's a pretty strong principle, strong argument. brave answer, and that's and it's true. So she gets points for that. She gets she, uh, for dishonesty about a better record, not not so much. And and also there was something about I me. Mean, she was sort of patting herself on the back for even admitting that she had used marijuana, which, of course, everyone does that now. It's not, not a big deal anymore, you know, to admit that, that you smoke pot. I mean, we have to sort of assume that people of a certain age have because as the majority of them have. And and you have to explain why you didn't, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you didn't. Like, what was wrong with you? What was wrong with you? Um, yeah. Yes. But uh, so I found that, ref- that, that one comment refreshing. And I think we need – to talk about that more, that there's that fun is good. But on the question, I mean, of, it seems like it's obvious, but I mean, it yeah, isn't to me. Well, you know, that, that 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 pleasure, other things being equal, pleasure is good. Now, obviously, you can get pleasure in ways that are harmful to yourself or other people, and that's where you have to start to be concerned. But that is not true for the vast majority of drug users. But in this time right now, we have, you know, people would say, I think seventy two thousand people died. Last year, from overdoses, and we've had a, a crisis. Uh, this was called a crisis in opiates. Maybe based on a lot of people, not prescriptions as we discussed, but a lot of people seeking happiness, let's say, or some sort of pleasure right. in a drug and finding themselves instead destroying their lives and eventually dying. I mean, it, it has been astounding uptick right. in these deaths. And well, is this the right time to advocate for legalization? Is there ever a when, right time? When, when, yeah, but I mean... <laughs> is there ever a wrong time? Well, I think, um, I think, you know, 2000, there were, you know... Yeah, I think, I think, yes, you're right. 20, I mean, drug, deaths, drug-related yeah. deaths uh, have been going up pretty dramatically. Under prohibition, right? So that's not uh, incidental or something. You want to say aside. This is under under a regime of prohibition. Now, I'm not saying no one's going to die, you know, uh, after taking drugs if if the drugs are illegal. But it's certainly true that the drugs are much more dangerous when they're when they're illegal. And you see this quite clearly uh, in what happened after the government cracked down on opioid prescriptions. Now, for sure, people were dying after taking uh, legal, legally produced opioids, but tip- typically in combination with other drugs, which is something we should not ignore. This is, uh, it, you know, if you mix it with other depressants or with other prescription drugs, it can be very dangerous. And some of these people maybe are just being careless or reckless. Some of them may be just so miserable that they don't really care if they wake up. You know, you don't know exactly what's going on. But that definitely happens with people using those legally produced pills. But once you crack down on those pills saying we don't want them to get, you know, clearly we're, doctors are prescribing too much, we have to cut back. First of all, you hurt bona fide patients who, who end up not getting the, the pain relief they need. But then you're also, the, for, even for the non-medical users, you're driving them into the black market. And so what happened after the government succeeded in pushing down uh, prescription for opioids, the – uh, trend in, in opioid-related deaths had not only continued upward, it accelerated. Uh, and I don't think that's a coincidence because you're – and in fact, people predicted that this was going to happen because uh, you push them from a market where you're getting predictable doses of a substance that you know that's labeled, right, uh, to buying these mystery powders or sometimes pills. Like some they're pressing – uh, drug drivers are pressing fentanyl into pills, right, and disguising them. Can you imagine, right? So that's not – 
You think it's oxycodone, but it's not actually. Yeah. Um, so that's scary. And, and the data show why you should be scared of that because the death rate, I mean, it's hard to estimate the actual number of like uh, regular heroin users, but based on estimates generated like uh, by the, the Rand Corporation, um, the death rate among heroin users is several times higher than the death rate among non-medical users of prescription opioids because there, it's not just fentanyl, but I mean, there's always a wide, wide range of potency and it's totally unpredictable. You don't know what you're getting. And so it was already dangerous uh, in the black market, but with the introduction of fentanyl as either a heroin fortifier, and this is all driven by the black market that you, so why, why did heroin need to be fortified? <laughs> because it was, it was expensive to produce because of the conditions of the, the economics of prohibition and it gets diluted and diluted and diluted. And at a certain point is that your customers don't want it anymore. So you're like, I'll add some of this much cheaper substance to it and that'll boost it. Of course, if you put in a little too much, it can be problematic. And if people don't realize it has fentanyl in it, um, they can be in trouble because they're expecting one potency. They get something stronger. Um, and then ultimately fentanyl started to replace, just replace heroin. So they call it heroin, but it's actually fentanyl and which is problematic, obviously, because fentanyl is much more potent and you don't know at any given moment what exactly what you're getting. So that's a very dangerous situation and it's made worse by the intervention of, of trying to reduce opioid prescriptions and also by cracking down. I mean, to the extent that, that the, Supply control efforts aimed at heroin are successful, and they're not that successful. But to the extent they do anything at all, they're only encouraging traffickers to move toward more compact forms of drugs. And so because fentanyl is so much more potent, you can mail you know, uh, what is uh, an enormous supply in a little thin package from China, right? Um, and it can never be. There's so many packages, and it can never be intercepted. Um, so you've made the problem, you know, for, from the point of view of the drug warrior, the problem is now even more difficult. Uh, but that's, you know, what they call the iron law of prohibition. And it's not like heroin users were crying out for, can you give me something that's <laughs> that more potent and yes. might kill me, might not kill me? Um, and, and in fact, you know, if you look at interviews with them, the vast majority say this is not something we want. It's not something we seek out. It's something that's been foisted upon us. And the reason that happens is because of the incentives created by prohibition. Uh, we've known this forever. I mean, during alcohol prohibition, there was a very clear shift from beer and wine toward distilled spirits. Uh, even though it wasn't like the beer and wine drinkers were like, oh, we don't like beer and wine anymore. It was the, that was what the the economic incentives created by prohibition encouraged. Um, and it can go beyond that. You know, it can go be, beyond the, there are fentanyl analogs that are even more potent than fentanyl, which is already more potent than heroin, right? And, uh, you know, that's, that's a very dangerous situation. But we have a problem with, uh, so it, it, in terms of addicts, so, or, or compulsive use or chemical dependency. Um, it's interesting because I also want to talk a little bit about in your, in your book about the anti-smoking crusade, which I think this is all re relevant. We have this idea of public health, which we've been kind of touching on. Like how do you weigh the costs of this versus the benefits? And you, as your subtitle for, for, for your own good is the tyranny of public health, which is a strong statement. Um, the, smoking is a drug. Nicotine is a drug. People use, they get addicted to it, um, and they die a lot. So, you know, these, same with opiates, they did, did to do it, they die in scores. And, and I mean, how, sh how are public health officials getting involved in these campaigns in a way that is tyrannical in either, in both of these situations? Well, okay. Or the, the, um, drug policies can be, cons can be criticized from a public health point of view, meaning you can say you claim to be trying to minimize morbidity and mortality. That's what you're supposed you're to be not, doing. Yeah. But you're not, yeah. right? And so good examples of that are, are, you know, people who resist harm reduction measures. So when it comes to heroin, you're talking about things like needle exchange or supervised consumption sites or even naloxone, which, uh, was not very controversial. It's not, it's widely accepted that that should be distributed and be as accessible as possible. But there were some people who voiced objections saying you're only encouraging them. If you, less if you left, if you have this antidote widely available, then people are going to be more likely to use heroin and less likely to quit. That was the argument. And people made the same argument with needle exchange. They said, we don't want them to have cleaning. Let them worry about getting AIDS. <laughs> that deters them, right? Yeah. That was sort of the idea. And it, deter, it doesn't deter those particular, it deters other people who might otherwise have used it. That was sort of the idea. And that really, is the logic of prohibition that you want to make life as miserable as possible for the people who dare to defy prohibition, um, the better to deter others. It doesn't help them. They're screwed. Uh, their lives are much worse than they would otherwise have been had these drugs been legal. 
but the other people who might have become addicts, those are the ones we're helping. And of course, these are hypothetical people <laughs> who may, may or may not actually exist, but they might they might exist. So you can criticize it from uh, oh, and the other example of harm reduction, which is relevant now, especially is this uh, you know vaping as a substitute for smoking, which is indisputably much less hazardous, no question about it. And no matter some of the wishy-washy things you might hear from public health officials or from anti-smoking activists, it's very clear that, the, that if you are smoking and you switch to vaping and that's how you're getting your nicotine now, you're much better off in terms of health risk. No question. Um, but then if you say, oh, we're worried about teenagers vaping, therefore we need to ban all the flavors. Well, the flavors are the things that the adults overwhelmingly prefer as well as the teenagers. Uh, if you look at what smokers use when they switch from from cigarettes – uh, or conventional cigarettes to e-cigarettes, they are overwhelmingly using the same supposedly kid-friendly flavors that, they, that the teenagers are using. So that's the problem. So if you deprive people of the products they like, a certain percentage of them are going to go back to smoking. So you can say that those policies, even though they're allegedly in, in, the, name of, they're in the name of public health, they're actually undermining public health. And I do make that argument because I would say even on your own terms, you are failing. Yeah. So some, you, something's gone wrong somewhere. And, and for a lot of drug policy is driven more by sort of these irrational prejudices, in this case against something that looks kind of like a cigarette, right, um, than it is by the desire to actually reduce the harm associated with drug use. If you're serious about harm reduction, there are all kinds of policies you ought, ought to support even if they make drug use – because they make drug use safer. Uh, you know, from the prohibitionist point of view, you may – we don't want to make it. We want it to be as dangerous as possible, the better to deter people. But if you don't accept that morally, and public health people certainly shouldn't because they're supposed to be concerned about actual damage done, uh, you should support harm reduction. So one thing I try to do is try to get public – people who claim to be acting in the name of public health to pursue harm reduction consistently. Um, in some circles, uh, in some political circles, it is more acceptable to have, you know, needle exchange or even supervised injection facilities than to allow vaping yeah. <laughs> to exist as a society. Absolutely. And, and yeah, so that's crazy to me. I, I want people to try to be consistent. But then, so the, deep, the deeper critique is that this is really not the way we should be making public policy. And the reason I say the tyranny of public health is because the ultimate implications of this argument are tyrannical. Uh, if you are saying that anything people do that may result in disease or injury, and sometimes it goes even further, poverty and anything else unpleasant, but let's stick to disease and injury for the time being. Anything that, that could result in disease or injury is something the government needs to discourage and tax and possibly ban and regulate and so on. That's almost all of life. I mean, everything carries, everything that humans do carries some level of risk. And now – so you've given the government a, a sweeping mandate, mandate to intervene in all kinds of choices that used to be considered personal choices. And so and in, that, in the book about the anti-smoking movement, I said you're going to see this with obesity because people were already talking about the epidemic of obesity. And this was going to – this is something that the government is going to say. That's our job too. We have to stop people. We have to uh, – Poke and prod people, right? In terms and to, to to encourage them to eat properly and not eat too much and to get more exercise. Or they're addicted too. They, they could be addicted to dancing. Yeah, you know? I think that. Well, there is some. I they, think that's they, a valid analogy. That that they, you know that people who have trouble controlling what they eat, it is very similar dynamic to people who are addicted to drugs or to gambling or any of these other uh, sources of pleasure that can become excessive preoccupations, right? Um, they elevate, you know, short-term pleasure over long-term goals or concerns. Mm -hmm. Every, I think everybody's had that experience with something. Uh, probably most have had it. Uh, most of us have had it with with food, yeah. of one kind or another. Um, but anyway, yeah. So there is a similarity there. And uh, but if you're going to say anything that causes disease or injury is a legitimate target of government intervention, then you've got a really big government that's that's interfering in all kinds of choices. And then this is the question of how far does it go, right? So, I mean, I think I speculated about about uh, you know taxing uh, fatty foods and stuff, but people actually seriously propose that taxing you know highly caloric foods with this little nutritional value, and you have so you would have taxes based upon how many calories they deliver versus how many you know valuable nutrients and. Um, and I suggest it. I know I may regret it because because <laughs> they might, might give up ideas. Yeah. That's a good idea, but really, it's not fair. Because if you tax ice cream, and, uh, somebody who's thin and just occasionally has ice cream, he has to pay that tax, even though he's not misbehaving. Like he's not overweight, he's not out of shape, he's not costing the government money, right? But he has to pay the tax. So that's not right. If you want to, you, a targeted tax would tax people based on how much they weigh. 
And for, so for each pound over their ideal weight, they would pay a tax. And it would not like the government's not forcing people to lose weight. It's an economic incentive. You know, that's all. Uh, and uh, it's giving them those ideas. Totally. <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of scary, me, Jacob. Because um, I mean, that I, makes so much sense that I, someone's going to take yes, out that. Yes, it's up. a much more efficient yeah. approach. Yeah. You should yeah. tax the weight. That's the thing you're concerned about, right? They don't do the the the, the in between. You know, the uh, the inputs tax the uh, the output because that really gives people. Because then the person can choose. I might stop eating ice cream, or I might exercise more. Yeah. It's like with uh, it's like with carbon credits or you know pollution credits. Uh, they can decide how best to reduce uh, uh, pollution. You don't dictate the way they do it. You just say you have to reduce pollution. So you just say uh, either well or you don't have to. You can just pay the cost, right? So. Uh, I'm not sure that will ever happen. I'm not sure there will be like mandatory calisthenics in the public square or anything like that. But this is where, I mean, logic, this argument logically leads because it gives no weight to liberty and it gives no weight to individual preferences. Um, and, and no weight, honestly, to, to letting just letting people make their own mistakes because people will do mess up for sure. And people will get into trouble and some of them will die. And that's, you know, part of, of being free is <laughs> being free to make uh, bad decisions. Uh, and the idea that government should always be second guessing those and trying to stop you from making them, I think, is is highly problematic. Well, I've had public health people tell me that the uh, the optimal amount of smoking is zero. Um, that, that no one that, you know, right. that there's no efficient level of smoking and, and yes and that's you know and that seems to me and this crazy because they were, right. I would say do you think that about hamburgers and hang that's the part part of this fanaticism and, yeah. so that to me and that that's prohibition uh, Jacob, Jacob, Jacob Greer has a new book about the anti-smoking movement he was on movement. the he was and, on the show so, about two so, weeks ago yeah. so and he's trying to encourage a culture of uh, sort of a sophisticated tobacco use of, of premium product and it's similar to like the craft cocktail yeah. movement or slow food movement or the craft beer movement right uh where you know he doesn't think you know mass he thinks mass produced cigarettes are terrible and they never should have been he wishes they'd never been invented and whatever and you know because of everyone who's died prematurely as a result of using them um and but he still likes a nice a cigar from time to time, and he likes uh, to smoke a pipe from time to time. And if you look at the data, these things are mu these are much less hazardous, especially if you're doing it occasionally. There's no question about that, by the way. And that was one of the things that maddened me when I was writing the the book about the anti smoking movement is that no one wanted to admit that the average pipe smoker has much much lower risk than the average cigarette smoker. Why? Because the average cigarette smoker is smoking a pack a day. He's sucking all the smoke into his lungs, um, and he goes through the whole pack. The average pipe smoker, first of all, is not consuming as often, is not consuming as much, and he's not inhaling generally. I mean, the pipe smokers rarely inhale, and that makes a huge difference because that means you're getting much less exposure to all of these toxins and carcinogens. Not to say there are no toxins and carcinogens. Anytime you light anything on fire, <laughs> there are toxins and carcinogens, but the exposure is much lower. And so we know the lower the dose, the lower the risk, other things being equal. And it's like no one would admit that. Or what about cigar smoking? No, it's just as bad as cigarettes. And it's just obviously not true based on the data, right? So can we have a world where... Um, I can say I understand there is some risk attached to smoking these cigars or have, smoking a pipe, but I want to. I'll accept that risk. It gives me a lot of pleasure. I enjoy it. And um, it was, according to public the public health ideology, I don't think there is room for that. Well, that's a thing because it's because what do you get? You like you said, it's just pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, it's nothing. This, it's, it's, it, it counts these two for, together. Yeah, it counts, it counts for nothing, um, and it should it count for something. So. Um, so that's very problematic because you're not – I mean it's a collectivist calculation of how much uh, you know, disease and premature death do we have versus you – know, and how, how much can we reduce that without any, without any consideration to trade-offs. And that's what that's why I thought I came in with both books here in front of me because, and you brought up Jacob who I said was on the show I think two weeks ago or three weeks ago. Um, you are defending tobacco use and defending drug use. I mean, at some point, it's like against the public health framework. You need to step up and be like, "Look, I'm going to defend the way that people receive pleasure, right? Even though it might be harmful to them, as opposed to apologize for it." It's like it's yes. so we need people to defend tobacco use. We're going to have to have people defend McDonald's and other things that they're going to come after, and also. Just drug use, illicit drug use, or or you know we're not really supporting the freedom of individuals. In the, yes, in the, and in look, I I, I accept that some people don't approve of these things, 
Um, I haven't come across a good moral argument for why their you know drug use is inherently wrong, especially if people, as I uh, usually do, are making a distinction between alcohol, for example, and and the currently illegal drugs. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Once you legalize marijuana, is it no longer? Is it now morally acceptable? Because now it's I'm not sure it how that like works. A strange well, you could you could idea. say it's wrong to disobey the law. Yes, yes. So now it's okay now. That, that's one perspective, right? But I, I was I, I tried to kind of find moral perspectives that just said this is just in general bad. And so, for example, <laughs> uh, uh, Mormons, Mormons yeah. generally eschew psychoactive substances. Um. Including uh, tobacco, what was referred to as hot beverages in the in the original text, which is interpreted to mean coffee and tea, and possibly by extension caffeine. Although that's controversial, some people say <laughs> caffeine and soft drinks might be okay. And and I know a lot of Mormons eat chocolate, and chocolate has stimulant as theobramine and also some caffeine in it. So I'm not sure why that's okay, or hot chocolate is okay versus tea and tea and coffee, whatever. So the, you start to dig, and it's like doesn't seem that consistent. And then you look at like uh, the uh, consumption of prescription psychoactive drugs in Utah, <laughs> and it's off the charts, which is because that's medicine, right? right? And so I don't mean to pick on the Mormons. I'm just saying, in the end, what looks like a consistent opposition to, to use of psychoactive substances is not, and it again becomes well, it depends on the consequences, right? If you're depressed and this makes you not depressed, and now you're more functional, that's an improvement. Um, I really like my my cocoa, my hot cocoa, even though it has uh, stimulants in it. It doesn't hurt my, doesn't disrupt my life. Um, it's a pleasure and it's harmless, and why not? That's fine. I think that, but but ultimately, so they're applying the same kind of reasoning that I do, but they're pretending that they're not. They're pretending to have a categorical ban. An another example of this was uh, what they called Mormon tea, which is a kind of ephedra. And so you it wouldn't have regular tea, you know, you know, from from India <laughs> or China, uh, but they would have uh, uh, this uh, native plant that just grew naturally and also contained stimulants. So, so to some extent, the, they seem to be pretending to a more a more consistency that they actually show. So that's just one example. And then you can look at at Muslims and what's their attitude. Um, and, you know, they have the same kind of thing, whereas like wine was the thing that was originally condemned. Like, well, what about distilled spirits and <laughs> hard cider and beer, you know? And, and, mo and I, I think most, most Muslim legal scholars would say by implication, that's also prohibited, although there's some very liberal ones who will say, no, it's okay. And there's, I think there were probably a lot of Muslims who rationalize it by saying, I can have whiskey. It just says wine. <laughs> but. Right. So, um, and then there's a, was a controversy o among Muslim legal scholars over the status of tobacco. So that was a very widespread habit Even among Muslims who didn't drink at all, uh, would still, you know, use hookahs, right? Um, was that okay? And ultimately there were a few rulings saying, no, it's not. Why? It's not because it's inherently evil, but because it's, it's damaging to the health and therefore it's prohibited. Um, so it's not the psychoactivity, right? It is the health consequences of smoking. That's the problem. Well, so now if you have vaping, you have e-cigarettes, you've eliminated almost all of those health consequences. Is that now acceptable? Even though it's the same active ingredient, it's in a different form. Is that therefore acceptable? And so I'm just, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm just trying to tease out the rationale and see is it, if it is context dependent and, um, Result oriented in the sense that it's the results that matter. It's what, what this actually does in the context of your life that matters. And I feel like anytime you dig into these, uh, sort of what seem to be broad prohibitions, you start to get to that kind of reasoning where it's like, well, is it really causing a problem? Is it really a big deal? Is it, you know, I mean, unless the, unless the original like prohibition was very specific, it's very hard to get away from the prohibition of wine because that's, uh, that's explicit. Um, but w when it, when it comes to other kinds of psychoactive substances is not clear. Well, what about hashish? Is hashish? implicitly covered by the ban on wine, you know. Um, so I think people start to look at, and, and the people who said hashish should be forbidden uh, for Muslims would say, look at what it does. It makes you lazy and you just lie around and you don't accomplish anything or whatever. So they're making arguments about uh, the consequences as opposed to something being inherently wrong with it. And that's the same is true with public health officials that we're looking at. So we have Mormons who have these principles for what should and shouldn't be regulated, which doesn't seem entirely consistent. And a lot of public health people have a similar type of 
inconsistencies or um, the way they approach different substances. The, some ones extent, that they, the ones that they use versus the ones that they don't use. Well, to some extent they do. I mean, I mentioned that, I mean, you can find public health paper like we absolutely should have needle exchanges proven to work and we, we should open up uh, uh, supervised injection facilities, which is still very controversial yeah. and illegal under federal law, yeah, at least according yeah. to the Justice Department, um, even though some cities would like to do it. Uh, but others and are, then you yeah. say, well, what about vaping? And they're like, we have to ban that. The yeah, whole generation like, of kids are getting addicted. We need to ban, maybe even uh, definitely, we'll say we should ban flavored vaping products, and some of them will say we just should ban it entirely. Well, you just have all sorts of things. And then like what about taxes. the smokers who are gonna, who had switched to vaping and now they're going to go back to smoking? Yeah. Well, I, I ultimately they would like to ban cigarettes, I guess, but they well, rec- the, the soda taxes like also are often not put on, you know, frappuccino things from Starbucks. There's a lot of inconsistency here, yes. too. Right? I mean, you remember uh, Michael Bloomberg's big beverage ban, yeah, right? Yeah. It was like the details of that were like if you work at a place like Starbucks and you have to figure out what's allowed, what's not allowed, you're like tearing your hair out, right? So I think they ultimately did exempt – I think they exempted coffee shops just entirely because it was just impossible. Um, but uh, – so you know the, the, that idea. So the so his idea was not just that you, you tax it. That's beyond the taxing the soda. And that there are other other jurisdictions where they're taxing uh, sugar sugary soft drinks, right? And it's sort of a public health rationale. It's like we want to discourage it, but also we want to raise money. And we, furthermore, we've earmarked this money for this wonderful purpose for like preschool programs or whatever. And it's like well. What if you're really successful and everybody just stopped drinking soda? Now you have no money for this wonderful program. So it's like they kind of want people to keep drinking soda. But typically what will happen is that the people will just go to neighboring jurisdictions where they don't have the same soda tax. Uh, so he went beyond the tax and said, we're just not going to allow sodas uh, above a certain volume. I forget. Was it a pint? I think it was a pint. I think it was a pint was a cutoff. Nobody needs a 32-ounce soda. Nobody needs a big gulp, right? It's like that thats that attitude right there. That, <laughs> summarizing that sentence is very scary because that, that's – Michael Bloomberg is sort of uh, he embodies that whole attitude of this pub, this public health tyranny, and he sincerely believes it. I, I don't uh, I don't think he's faking it. I don't think he's doing it for political reasons or anything like that. He sincerely believes that smart people like him have a duty to less enlightened people to encourage them to improve their lifestyles so they will be healthier and live longer. That he honestly believes that, and I mean he, he's given speeches where this is government's highest purpose. Also, it's gun. like also re- guns. It's like really, that's the highest purpose. Like not, it's not protecting us against foreign invaders. It's not arresting violent criminals. It's not administering the court system. No, before all that is making sure people don't drink excessively large sodas. Um, and but he really believes that, and obviously that has you know that extends to. Even dur- you know during his service as mayor, you saw that it extended to things like salt and trans fats and all kinds of tobacco products um, and really anything anything that that poses a, a risk. So the the libertarian mantra on this is is inform consumerism and what and and if you want to hurt yourself, you can. But there's pleasures out there that 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 can be had in harmful substances and we need to defend those pleasures a little bit more than maybe we have been, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you can, look, you can't avoid it. I mean, you can ban a lot of things. You're not going to ban everything. People are always, and, and even if you ban it, obviously, it doesn't eliminate it, as we've discovered right, over the last hundred years of, of drug prohibition. Uh, you can pretend it's gone, but it's not actually gone. And in many ways, it becomes more dangerous. Uh, but is like, is that how humans should live? Is that what, is the, you know, it to live a virtuous, meaningful life do you need to be protected from every possible temptation by force of law? Is that how humans should live? Is that a way, <laughs> you know, to have, uh, you know, for humans to flourish? I mean, that's a deep question, right? Um, and, you know, communists answer that one way and, and other kinds of collectivists answer it one way, whereas individualists <laughs> have a different answer and they will say, um, First of all, I like this and you may not like it. It may not be your cup of tea. Maybe in some cases, literally not your cup of tea uh, if you're Mormon. But uh, but that doesn't mean that you should stop me from doing it. And furthermore, go beyond that you because know, I like it. I enjoy it. I get ple- that pleasure is important to me and you should respect that. Furthermore, you may have people making bad choices when it comes to these things and harming themselves. That's definitely going to happen. Um, but to have the government come in and second guess those decisions because maybe down the road it will lead to ruin. Um, first of all, I don't think it's going to lead to better outcomes, even in a, from a cost benefit perspective. If we're going to be pure utilitarians about this, 
I don't think those bureaucrats are going to be very good at weighing all the relevant costs and benefits because they don't know the person that they're, they're trying to regulate, right? That, you know yourself best. You know your own tastes and preferences and circumstances and all that. The government doesn't have a clue about that. Um, but somehow it's going to come in and, and tax and regulate you in exactly the right way to achieve a, an optimal outcome. I'm just skeptical <laughs> that that's going to happen. Um, and, and, and not to, to find a point on it is it's one of the arguments for these kinds of interventions is that people are just not very good at understanding risk and, and making decisions accordingly. And they tend to discount you know, relatively distant hazards and all that. And they're just bad decision makers and they fall prey to all of these, uh, heuristics that are misleading. And therefore we need to come in. It's like, wait, aren't you human too? <laughs> so, so we just established that humans are so bad at reasoning, right? That, that even when it comes to the circumstances of their own lives, which is the thing they know best, better than anyone else, they're still not very good at it. But somehow you're going to come in and you don't, and you don't know any of that information, but you're going to be better. It's like, how does that work? So I'm very skeptical. <laughs> from a practical point of view, but just morally, it's ju not justified. And um, and I, I, when it comes to drug policy, I, I always push both of those arguments. Um, I mean, one way of saying it is that it's just not, it's not right to arrest people for doing things that don't violate other people's rights and, you know, putting people in cages for things like growing marijuana or selling cocaine. That's just wrong. And it always will be wrong. Even if you can show that now we have fewer, you know, potheads and, and, and which you don't because it's not very effective. But even if you could, it still wouldn't be justified. Um, and once, you know, you violate that principle that people should be, you know, sovereign over their own bodies and minds and they should be able to decide what goes into their own bodies, uh, it causes all sorts of problems. So that's the practical part of it is like, you may not philosophically agree that people are sovereign over their own minds and bodies, but you're going to have to recognize the consequences of disregarding that principle. And they're very serious and they're, you know, and we can see them all around us in terms of, uh, the impact of the war on drugs. Uh, not just on dr the drug users who face a much more dangerous environment, environment, not just in terms of violence and corruption, not just here, but in other countries, right? That, who, who are, who are sort of pressured to imitate our policies. Um, in terms of people who never even touch these drugs, right? Uh, who, so, so they're, Car radios, I don't know if people have car radios anymore. It's not a good example, but they're getting burglarized more than they otherwise would be because above the people who do become addicts, now their half, their half is much more expensive than it would be if the drugs were legal. So that's uh, a, a significant effect because people are buying valuable property. They're selling at a drastic discount. So the, 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 uh, size of the loss is greater than the benefit even to the addicts. So even if like you disregard whose property it is, that's a serious problem. Um, all the ways in which the courts have whittled away at civil liberties in order to facilitate the war on drugs. So you don't use drugs at all and you don't grow drugs, you don't sell drugs. You still can't be confident the police are not going to knock down your door and accidentally kill you or kill you on purpose because they knock down your door and you think it's a burglar and you take out your gun and now you're dead. And that happens. And for sure your dog is dead. Even if they don't kill you, they're going to kill your dog. Um, uh, I mean, it just uh, these cases where, like, they uh, just will give you one example. It's on my mind because I read, read about recently this case in Kansas where this father was growing vegetables in a science project with the kids. He goes to this hydroponic store and he buys, I don't even it actually never specify what he buys, he buys some kind of equipment or supplies for that purpose. He leaves that store. A cop who's staking out the hydroponic supply store uh, makes a note of the guy's license plate number, looks up his information. And this is, all right, so this was in Kansas State. So it was in Missouri, but he passes the information on to the cops in Kansas because the car is registered to somebody in Kansas. And this ultimately leads to a raid on the house. Now, <laughs> it wasn't just the fact that he visited the store. What that did is that caused an investigation where the cops searched through the trash. Why are they able to do that, by the way? They're able to search through the trash without a warrant. That's because of the war on drugs, because the Supreme Court said, that's okay. People don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in their garbage. You could be, if you, once you put it on the curb, it's, it's fair game for anybody. Um, and so they rummaged through the trash repeatedly and they found, uh, what did they call it? Vegetable matter yeah. that they uh, first time they came across it like I don't know that doesn't seem suspicious. The second time they're there, I, I should say that they had planned to do this, um, especially for uh, 
for uh, I'm sorry, the the, the Stoner holiday, uh, 420. 420, April 20th. So this April 20th is coming up. They were going to do a big publicity stunt where they raid, do marijuana raids on April 20th, um, and so far they don't really have any evidence. So they so they find the da- the ve- wet vegetable matter, and it's like we don't. That's nothing. They come back again. They find the same stuff, and now they think it looks like marijuana. <laughs> they decided, and then further they do a field test, and it's supposedly test positive, and these uh, for for THC. These field tests are notoriously unreliable. Uh, people in experience have shown that they react to all kinds of not of of legal substances that and identify them as drugs. Uh, but on the strength, and then they come back again and they test trash again, and they supposedly get a positive again. But but it turns out it was tea, and <laughs> it was the uh, the, uh, the 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 wife of the man who bought the who was doing the indoor gardening. Which she makes tea. She likes tea. This was like such a comedy of errors because the the cop who found it he testifies. He never he never had seen loose tea before. He didn't even know what that was, but he was pretty sure this was like marijuana. And then the lab tech who later looked at it after the raid um, was like, "This doesn't look anything like marijuana." If you look at it naked eye under microscope, it doesn't look anything like marijuana. It's not marijuana. We tested. In fact, it's not. Um, and but they raided this house uh, um, and they terrorized this family and they like tore apart their house because they're sure there's a marijuana garden somewhere. <laughs> and even after they're like, "Okay, we we've explored every possible space where there might they might be growing marijuana. Surely they've done something else illegal, <laughs> right?" So and it turns out they were you know. Nothing had done nothing. They hadn't broken the drug laws, um, but so that kind. Of, so there's an example of somebody who's not involved with drugs at all, and and is a, a sort of a is collateral damage from the war on drugs. Another familiar example is um, civil asset forfeiture, where police take stuff. Now, when you explain this to people who haven't heard about it, they think it's like that can't be true. Police will take your property, and they just allege that it is connected to drugs in some way. They don't have to say how. I mean, you read if you ever read these affidavits, there's just boilerplate. It's like I found a large quantity of cash, which of course is inherently suspicious, and I'm alleging that it is either going to be either the profits from selling drugs, or maybe it's going to use it to buy drugs. It's something to do with drugs. <laughs> Take my word for it. Okay, so once they've done that, now the burden is on the owner to try to recover it, and very frequently it costs more to hire a lawyer than the sto- than the stolen. I say stolen because it is stolen <laughs> property is worth, um, and this can happen to anybody. You don't have to actually be involved in drugs. You just have have to be carrying uh, what the police consider to be suspiciously large amounts of cash, you have, uh, or maybe uh, you have a house and unbeknownst to you, somebody who lives there is going. You know, this actually happened. You know, grandparents can lose the house because their grandson in the backyard was growing a couple of, of pot plants. Uh, so innocent people lose their property, and that's you know. So that's just a, yet another example of the chaos that, you, <laughs> that ensues from violating this principle that you should respect people's choices when it comes to what they put in their own bodies. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, you can find our Free Thoughts discussion group on Facebook or on Reddit at r slash Free Thoughts Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. As always, please rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible and Landry Ayers. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org. Libertarianism.org's podcast, The Pursuit, is back with Season 2. It features real stories of people who are pursuing happiness in the face of pernicious institutional forces. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you listen to podcasts.